that, I'm going to get into the Word of God now, so please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer before we hear this word today. Father, I thank you for what you've done here today, Lord. I thank you for those that have been able to be here today. I thank you for what you're doing in this city, Father God, as there are many people coming together right now praising and worshiping you. Lord, I thank you for this group here, for those watching online, Lord, for the things that have been spoken already through the, through the prophets in the house, through the ministers in the house, Father God. And we thank you now, Lord, as we get to hear this word, Father God, and that it be your speaking through me, Father God, that we understand more about your words in this book called the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for this all, and all of this we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, for what he did for us, for his death, burial, and resurrection, Father God. We thank you in his mighty and matchless name. Amen. So, you can go ahead and put the, the graphic up there, Blythe. There's this myth of this guy in the Greek culture. Um, he was walking along, and he was getting thirsty, and so there was a stream, a brook, a river, I guess, and he was thirsty, so he bends down to get a drink, and he sees his reflection, and he so admires himself that he couldn't take his eyes off himself. His name was Narcissus. It's where we get the name or the word narcissism. It's the love of the self. And myth or not, over 2,000 years later, that idea is still alive and kicking in our culture. This is the idea of an inflated insistence of someone inflating their own self-importance. In other words, there is literally no room for, for anyone else in their, in their lives which in turn translates into troubles with relationship and a lack of empathy for other people. And this concept has really been pushed to the forefront of the last few years or the last few decades of our culture. Now my personal um, you know, assessment is that social media has had the bis biggest effect on why this is gaining momentum. It's kind of like narcissism has turned into an epidemic. Let me explain. There, there's been lots of research now and studies coming out on this topic. Terms like helicopter parenting. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you're not. What it is, is parents will kind of hover over their children to make sure they never, inflict, uh, they never experience any pain, they seem to get whatever they want, they never have to cry, they never have to be disappointed. That's helicopter parenting. And then there's this other thing that's been going on. I, I can tell you, it didn't go on, and our kids are in their early 20s now. But uh, maybe I saw it, and I just didn't pay attention to it. But there was this thing, I guess, going on that started about two decades ago, maybe, 15 years ago, where if your kids participated in anything, let's say there's 10 of them, if you finish 10th last, you'd also get an award. Again, it kind of correlates with the rise of our American Idol show in the early turn of this century. Or this YouTube thing that's big now. Or this overall social media celebrity culture. Now, some of you will say this issue has always been around. You know what? I would agree with that assessment. I guess what I'm saying is that it's manifesting in a different way, but this different way has gotten way out of control. And then compounding this issue is this super sensitive society in which people are offended by any perceived slight, which then has turned into people rejecting biblical truth, which is why I'm bringing this to the forefront of us today. In other words, we can't just rationalize this narcissistic thing away. We can't just turn our heads and say, well, I don't want to deal with that, because it's here, and it's here in spades, okay? Now, Paul warned this young man that was starting a pastorate in Ephesus. His name was Timothy. He was given the charge to be the pastor there, and Paul warns him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and he says, Timothy, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. 
They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, having said all this, I need to bring this up. Because Scripture tells us, you know, to th this thing about what God's perspective of us. Pastor Tom was talking about it. My daughter, Alexandria Knight, on Wednesday hit on this. Let me tell you and talk to you about what I'm going to say. The Word of God says this. The Word of God says we are loved by God. The Word of God says we are fe fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible says our assignment is to be transformed and use the power of God to transform the world. The Bible says we're gifted and talented, and frankly, we are the kids of the Most High God, and we are worth dying for. Are we not? All right, the Bible says all of that, correct? So, you might be going, well, come on, Adam. The Scriptures tell us we're extremely valuable. In other words, Adam, this would imply that narcissism would never touch my life as a Christian. I mean, Adam, I'm just proclaiming the Word of God about me. So why, oh, why are you emphasizing that Christians have a problem with narcissism? Okay, I'd say fair enough. All the cards are on the table. Let's pause now and ask some questions to see how we're doing in this area about our calling and our giftings. I've observed and taken on this assignment to address this issue. I believe many, if not all, will agree with me when we hear the following. We will find that many times it is our longing for approval which drives our decisions. Our appetites for acceptance will take us to places that our character will not be able to sustain us. It will take us to places that we do not have the capacity to say no to. Now this is where you might have heard me say this. You might have heard this somewhere else, but I say this here quite a bit. And this is where this jumps right in. The anointing of God, the gifts of God, will destroy you if your character is not up to speed with the assignment that God has given you. Now, what also seems to happen at the same time is people will, you know, claim that their dreams and visions become their rights. Let me explain. Some folks rationalize that their popularity determines if they are successful or not. Some folks are blind to notice that their needs have been rationalized to become their necessities. And finally, some will determine that their celebrity can be interpreted like this is an anointing. Okay? Now, having said all this, I also need to point out at this time that there are people that have been taught that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all your dreams are going to come true. I have heard Christians say that. I have heard pastors and teachers say that. And no doubt, that makes people really happy and want to continue to listen to that kind of itching ear stuff, right? And they're going to sign up for any program by that itching ear teacher that Paul warned us about. Let, let me just tell you, if you're here and you've heard that, let me, I'm, you know, I've got to burst your bubble here, but that's not what Jesus taught at all, right? That is, however, what you will hear if you get on 95 and drive about two and a half hours and hit four and head towards this city called Orlando where this place called Walt Disney World at. That's where your dreams come true, right? Come on now, right? So... I say that because it's necessary to ask, where is the calling of God a true call of God? And where is the calling a want about us? Where are these opportunities that are drawing us, you know, into and God and sending us out into God all about God? And where are they about our provision, protection, and acceptance? Now, just like a virus, just like a sickness, narcissism has symptoms to warn us or alert us to its presence. Just like when an epidemic strikes, we, we should want to know those things to, that we need to prevent our, that from attacking us with the sickness. I mean, we'd want to know those early warning signs if we had picked up something like this that acts like narcissism, right? Just like these slow-acting viruses that debilitate us and prevent us to know all that God wants from us. I mean, we'd want the cure. In fact, wouldn't we be upset if we found out there is a cure and our teachers didn't tell us about the cure? 
if the doctors knew about a cure and didn't tell us about the cure, I think we'd be upset. Well, just like in the medical field, the cure many times comes in the form of recognizing things which would then limit the formation of the virus to give us the fever. So, we would avoid those areas or those things to prevent the sickness from forming. Is this making sense? I hope you're understanding what I'm saying here. So I'm going to share just a few symptoms of narcissism to be aware of and avoid. Right off the bat is an exaggerated level of self-importance. Another one is a sense of entitlement that requires constant feeding of self-admiration. Another is accomplishments or achievements and talents seem to be exaggerated. We tend to believe that we're superior and only associate ourselves with well-known or popular people. In other words, a thing that a lot, of, a lot of us like to do is we'll name drop. People will expect favorable treatment. Or they take advantage of people to get what they want. In other words, the ends justify the means. And those are only a few symptoms describing narcissism. Now, if we make reviewing or looking at our behavior and habits our daily practice, if we stopped and reflect then about our culture and specifically about narcissism, I am reminded that I'm literally one breath away, folks, from heading down the road, that road. Being honest, this is the truth. We're, we're all just one breath away from heading down the broad road which leads to destruction. My ambitions, my appetites, my desire to be accepted is just one breath away from making me the center of the universe and away from making God the center of the universe. And then, what happens is we call that a calling. We call that a gifting. We call it serving. We call it sacrificing, when all along, it's about meeting my desperate needs. Well, what do you do if you find out this about yourself? What's the answer to fix that issue? Well, let's turn to Scripture once again. Let's look at what Jesus was saying in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. He's talking to these people and he goes, Whoever wants to be my disciple. Okay, who wants to be Jesus' disciple in here? Whoever wants to be Jesus' disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Not weekly, not monthly, daily. Wow. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for Jesus will save it. So let's be a little encouraging now and exhorting by considering what it will mean to take up our cross daily. Please be aware that oftentimes it's the environment that has a big impact on narcissistic behavior. Like coming to church now hearing this, I know a lot, it's quiet in here, so I know you're all going, oh dang, he's talking about me. But when you get in an environment where you feel real at ease and you go back to those it's like you go back to Egypt and you get comfortable and you go back to that same habit and routine. That environment is like feed for narcissism. It's fuel for narcissism. And now, and when I say that, don't forget, I'm talking about and referring to the environment of your own soul. How, in other words, how are your wounds healing? Are they still bleeding? And if they're bleeding, are you still, are you trying to help another person even though you're bleeding? How's your forgiveness going? How are the broken pieces of your life going? How is your emotional health? How's your physical health? What my observations have taught me is many people should embrace this concept of counseling for a season. Christian counseling. Now, now, that season might be three months, it might be a year, all right? But unfortunately, folks will dabble in counseling for one visit or a few visits, and then say they're healed. 
But in reality, as they continue on that same path for the next decade, just dabbling and getting help now and then, and never getting over their issues, and they've wasted a decade of their life to really have an impact for the kingdom of God. Right? Another way that you can take up your cross is to ask, how are you doing in your community? Ha <laughs> ha. I'm not talking a big, I'm talking your small little knit group community. In other words, are there a few trusted friends that know the real you? Not the superficial, always doing great you that usually comes through the door of a church. But those that can take some real time to be real and honest about you. That you can open up about. And finally, if narcissism is me at the center, then what does it look like to put somebody else at the center? I think it would be something like using all your giftings, all your callings, the privilege and the opportunity to sacrifice for the benefit of another person. Because if we will make that our habit, narcissism will be in our rearview mirror. Now, another roadblock to resolving this narcissistic behavior today is that some Christians have a perception that Jesus is always this mushy, lovey-dovey type of spiritual teacher. I mean, folks, Jesus wasn't always a Mr. Nice Guy who never offended anyone with his words or would go out of his way to avoid controversy. Some people have this misguided notion that Jesus was a feel-good preacher who was always sweet, kind, diplomatic, and never make waves or rock the boat. <laughs> folks, oftentimes the truth hurts. At times, the truth hits us right between the eyes and cuts like a knife. Contrary to what has been coming out of some preacher's mouth the last few decades, Jesus didn't preach cotton candy sermons. You know, I used this a, a month ago, this term, cotton candy sermons, and I kind of like it. You know, I'm talking about those, you know, cotton candy, that fluffy strings of sugar-goated thoughts that would be woven together to make people feel good about, you know, but they don't contain any spiritual nutrition. It's like eating air. Just think about cotton candy and you put it in, it looks good, it's got the sugary and then it's nothing. It's got no food value. Scripture indicates, you know, many times that it says, the common people heard Jesus gladly. And I would contend that's because Jesus told the truth without any religious pretenses or pulling any punches. But make no mistake about it, folks. Not everyone who heard Jesus was glad about it. I'm not suggesting at all that Jesus intentionally offended people, but the truth he spoke had a way of separating the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats. To be clear, Jesus was loving. He was graceful. He was compassionate. He was tenderhearted toward the outcast and the downtrodden of society. In fact, he went out of his way to visit where others refused to go visit. Most Jewish people at that time, due to prejudice, traveled around Samaria. Jesus deliberately went through it and broke down cultural and prejudices by even speaking to a woman at the well. Some things he did were considered scandalous in his culture. Things like what, Pastor Adam? Well, this. He touched and healed lepers. He befriended tax collectors and sinners. He allowed a sinful woman to touch and anoint him. He healed on the Sabbath day, and so forth. He worked outside the lines of social norm for a Jewish man, especially a rabbi. He challenged the status quo, he ruffled a lot of feathers, he made enemies, and he attacked the religious establishment. Yet Jesus shows compassion to sinners, but he also confronts their sin. He was very critical of corrupt religious leaders, and he even called, you know, people by some very unflattering names when they abused their position of power. He offended the Pharisees and his closest followers, the disciples. <laughs> Are you aware that he called Peter Satan? <laughs> well, what would you say if I said to you, you're Satan, if you're doing something wrong? If you're doing something narcissistic, he called the, the disciples doubters of little faith. He called the di disciples a faithless, perverse generation. He called them fools. Now that ain't no cotton candy stuff. Come on. Right? 
Jesus' blunt words didn't always make his hearers warm and fuzzy. Truth, folks, is like medicine. It doesn't always taste good initially, but it will help you heal eventually. Jesus' strange sayings are sometimes very hard to swallow, but they are words of life and salvation. Any skilled surgeon will hurt us first in the process of healing us. Jesus' sermons were often surgical. Short-term pain in exchange for long-term gain. He performed surgical surgery here on people's hearts with the sharp, sharp scalpel of his words, folks. Some thought Jesus was mean. When he put out the mocking mourners, right, before he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. If you don't know that story, that's in Mark chapter 5. This, the, 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 the little girl died, and the people are mourning, and he, he's, she's dead. And because of their doubt, he's like, get out of here. Only mom and dad are coming in their room with me. He chased them out. He goes, get out of the house. Just think about that. If you're mourning, and, some, and, 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 a, and a pastor would come in and goes, get out of here. Oh my gosh, what would go on? In, uh, we'd read all about this up and down, New York Times, all over social media, all over Facebook, correct? How could he be so insensitive, correct? Is, is that not what we live in every day, right? Others thought Jesus was too extreme when he whipped and drove the greedy money changers from the temple twice. He did it at the beginning of his ministry and at the end. He had a whip. He made a whip. I mean, come on, folks. Remember, Jesus is both the lion and the lamb, the perfect balance of both the tender and tough sides of love. In an age when preachers seem to walk on eggshells to avoid saying anything negative or offensive, the good shepherd feeds his sheep what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear. Right? The truth, folks, will not always make us feel good, but it will make us free. It'll make us free, right? Sometimes progress in life can be tough to measure. I mean, because right now, there are those of you in here, I'll guarantee you, that feel stuck. You feel stuck right now. You feel like, I, I don't know what to do. Or just the opposite. You might feel like you're making incredible progress or somewhere in between. Folks, of all the areas, and this is for wherever you line up on that spectrum right now, if things are going great or things are not going so great. Of all the areas in which we should want to make progress, it is our character. And see, you've got to understand, our character is inherently tied to our spiritual progress. I mean, you've got to ask yourself, how do you know how your character is doing? I mean, how do you really know? It's important because in the scheme of life, character trumps your gifting or your calling. The headlines, you read about it all the times, are littered with gifted people whose character or lack thereof caused their downfall. Your competency will take you only as far as your character will sustain you. It's just what I started, kind of shared that thing. Your gifting or your calling. The anointing will destroy you if your character is not up to line with what it is. See, the truth, folks, often breaks out in the tiniest, littlest, most insignificant moments of our lives. Here are just a few little moments to see how we're doing. Now, when you hear these, i got to believe we're going to get some laughter, right? You're going to maybe think some of these are silly. Maybe you even think they're inconsequential. But I contend that many of these will indicate a true test of where you are today with your character. All right. Here's the first one. What do you think when somebody takes your parking spot? Ah, see? Thank you, Lord, because this is the response I wanted. I wanted people to get a little lighthearted now because I was really heavy at the start. I'm talking about that moment when you're pulling into the mall or you're, you're um, going to the grocery store, you're going to some big event, or you know, the football games or whatever. A lot of people going. And you see that empty stall and all of a sudden somebody darts right in it. And then even at it, it's pouring out. Or that parking spot you always park at work, but it doesn't have a reserve sign, but then somebody else has the audacity to use that spot. 
What happens inside you in that moment? That's your character. Okay? All right, that's one. Here's number two. Okay, I talked to somebody this morning about this. I didn't tell her what it was, but here it is. Because I said, this one's going to get her. How do you react to slow internet? There she is. There she is. Okay. Now, okay, so that's Pastor Iana. Okay? Now, now, having said that about her, she might know that, not know this about me, but my wife does. Not sure about you, but if the state of my character would be entirely summed up by my reaction to slow internet or just the slow computer speed, I'd be locked up. <laughs> Fair enough? Fair enough? Yana, I'm right with you, sister. Patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Apparently, the Holy Spirit and I have some work to do on my patience. All right, amen. That's what I want. Come on now. This is just confession. This is good. This is looking at our character. All right, here's the next one. The gap, this one might be a little more confusing and might sting a little more, so I might not get as many hoo-hahs and hallelujahs. Okay. What the gap between what you think and what you say when someone compliments you. I mean, come on now, folks. Christians are famous for false humility. What I'm talking about is this. Oh, thank you. But that wasn't me. It was the Lord thing. All right? Now, that sounds good. But be aware that that has several problems with it. First, the Lord probably doesn't sing or preach as poorly as we do. Okay? And second, how many of us that claim... Well, nobody has told me how bad I really am has ascribed their gift to God at that moment. And just for argument's sake, let's say you really are gifted. You're really good. Even if you're decent at what you do or even great at it, there can be a gap between what you say publicly and what you're thinking privately. What you say, you know, you'll say things like, thanks, it really mu wasn't much. But what you're thinking is, yes, I've kind of rocked it, didn't I? Okay, come on. I'll let it pause for a moment. Come on, you know. Right? What you'll say is, oh, sure, I'm sure I, I don't deserve that. And what you're thinking is, yeah, I do. It's finally about time somebody noticed. Come on. Right? Folks, let me say this right now. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Let that sink in, okay? Okay, here's the next one. What do you tell yourself when you make a mistake? What self-talk loop plays in your head when you make a mistake? For too many of us, it's, it's unhealthy. It can range from, I'm so stupid, to, I never make mistakes. Other people do. Right? Neither of those are good. Again, mistakes are tremendous learning opportunities. Mat mistakes, folks, are rarely fatal. And one of the keys to success in life is to not, you know, know how many times, it's not how many times you get knocked down, but it's, will you get up just one more time than you've been knocked down? Okay? Here's the fifth one. How do you, oh, this is going to be something. How do you react when someone overfills the trash and doesn't take it out? Look who's standing up again. There's Miss Yana. There she is, Pastor Yana. Now, now, okay. Now this one, this trash one is all about, and there's others like this, but this one's all about our expectations we have of other people. Yes, I mean, isn't there an unwritten rule that people who overfill the trash should be the one to take it out? I mean, isn't there? Isn't there? Isn't that kind of like the one with the, the dishwasher? You know, if you run your dishwasher and the first one to open it up after it's clean should empty it out? Isn't that kind of like an unwritten rule? I don't know. just seems like it's the way it is. Right? All right. How about this one? 
What's your social media voice like? Okay, so let's get this out in the open at start. We're all complex. We're all diverse. We're all different. Okay? We all have moods, nuances, and fascinating parts of our personality. But chances are, your friends could sum up your personality with a single adjective. And if you're sh not sure that's true, then flip the equation. You can probably sum up your friend's social media voice in a single word. Like, angry. Insecure. If your friend summed up your social media voice in a single word, what would they use? Would they use snarky? Would they use bitter? Would they use braggy? Would, they be, would you be kind? Would you be cynical? Would you be hopeful? Would you be petty? Would you be helpful? Would you be jealous? Because we all have a voice. Your voice may be who you really are or pretend to be, but it's who you're called to be. Now, on the flip side of that one is this one. How do you react to other people's social media voice? I mean, come on, do you do a much better job than other people on social media? That's what you tell yourself, right? Because your voice is so beautifully appropriate, right? Hmm. That's the youth speaking. All right, here's the last one. This is one of my, my uh, this is something I took on a, about 15 years ago to check my heart, my character. What do you do with the shopping cart? What do you do with the shopping cart? Do you leave it in the parking lot? Do you put it in the stall? Do you put it around the pole? Or do you put them? I mean, folks, <laughs> folks, many places now over the last decade plus have even things outside where you don't have to take it all the way back in. You just put them in there. And people can't even do that. They're always like, hey, I'm so, you know, and, and I'm just going to give you an Adam Smitherman ism. Okay, so. We go to pub. I go. We go. When we go to Publix, they're all out there. I will make my way in, rain or shine, getting carts on my way in, and I'll take them in. Then when I come out, my cart, I will take it all the way back in. In other words, I'm not done until that cart is back in the store, or in a, one of those parking. What would that be called? Oh. The things, cart racks. So the cart racks, okay, cart, whatever, whatever. You, you guys know. You know what I'm talking about. But I'm, again, remember what we're talking about here. What about me? Like, these are things. If, if we're going to do what that man that hung on that tree for us and died, and was resurrected. And that's why we're believing. That's why you're here. You're curious about this man. You're trying to put the correlation. How does this tie in with me? These just everyday kind of things. And there's more. I'm sure some of you are thinking of other things. These kinds of things are letting you know at that moment how you're doing in relation to what he did for you that's it. That, that's it. That's why these are so important. I'm going to ask the band to return to the stage. And I, and I get that some of you here might be like, well, what is the spiritual connotation? Well, I just tried to explain it to you. If you don't think this is spiritual, I'm telling you, this is spiritual. Right? I mean, you might be thinking right now, what does this have to do with faith? Or with leadership. I'm just telling you, if you see somebody do that stuff, don't you say, you'd say, that's a good leader. I'd like to follow that person. I'd like to watch that person take out the trash when there's been umpteen people putting it on there and they just grab it and take it out and don't say a word until they're asked and they go, well, yeah, I'm just doing it because nobody else is because it needs to be done. Right? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is why don't we bring our faith to these everyday moments and ask God, well, what's going on with me? Because it can change more than you possibly realize. In fact, your, your reaction in moments like these probably says a lot about your actual spiritual maturity. <laughs> so I bring this up today so we can acknowledge our current spiritual temperature, individually and corporately. And often the things we think are signs of spiritual maturity, folks, are not. 
I mean, what are you thinking about faith in the little moments in your life? What is going on inside of you right now after hearing this today? I mean, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what do you want to say about what's going on in here right now after hearing this? If you haven't acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, <laughs> if you're having problems in these areas, guess what? So do people who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The difference is they've got something to tap into to, and, and admit it, and you don't have to keep putting on an act. That's why you come to receive Jesus Christ. That's why you're here if you don't know. You're curious. What is it about these people that will do some crazy, like, silly things and not be concerned about people making fun of them? That's what Jesus did. He wasn't concerned. He was going to go tell to the religious leaders and to those that were being narcissistic. The rich young ruler was one. The Bible doesn't call him narcissistic, but he is. Oh, Jesus, I follow all of these commandments. Jesus said, great, now get rid of all, your, all of your riches and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it because he loved himself too much. That's the truth. That's what's going on. So folks, we partake in communion here every Sunday. It's a way to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do this because he said, do this in remembrance of me. We thank him while we're doing it. We admit some of these things, some of these things that have been stirred up, some of these things that you didn't even think you did wrong. You're like, oh my gosh, thanks, Adam. Well, folks, that's what, that's what my assignment is, to stir this up so that your relationship with God can get stronger. The altar team will be up here. They're here to pray for you, pray with you, praise with you. Each of us at our, at our individual location can praise and worship the Lord as the band leads us again now. So I ask us all to come to our feet and continue in this day's praising and worshiping of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.